I'm E.G. Marshall. It might occur to you that uh, since I live so much in the world of the macabre, I could become jaded. Nothing could be further from the truth. For the deeper I delve into Satanism, the occult, the mystical history of the past, the more I realize how little I know, how much is yet to be revealed. An example, this tale. A quiet and unassuming one, but filled with such brooding and haunting terror that I'm sure you will share it with me. Our mystery drama, Never in This World, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Alexander Scorby. According to legend, if a man walked with his shins about a church, he would walk right into the arms of the devil. The word withershins is of Gaelic derivation and means to walk contrary to the path of the sun or counterclockwise. This is the story of an American of Scottish background who on an idle fancy challenged the legend at the beginning of this century and stirred up old ghosts from two centuries before. Now. All right, Mr. Blodgett, you and Martha handle the bags. Yep, yeah, I'll take care of that, Miss Campbell. Now take my arm, David, and step down carefully. Oh, don't be foolish, Lucy. I can manage by myself. After the siege you've been through right at death's door? <laughs> I only had the influenza. That was months ago. Followed by what amounted to a nervous breakdown. That's why we're up here again. Dr. Chambers is an old fuss pot. Oh, nervous breakdown. Just plain debilitation, dehydration. But no matter, no matter. I'm, I'm grateful to him just the same. Oh, smell that good New Hampshire air. Never mind smelling it. Feel it. Chilly as always. You get right in the house. In good time, in good time. First of all, a little walk. I think I'll uh, stroll on down and see how Ephraim weathered last winter. But that's, that's nearly a mile's walk. Oh, just a stroll. Now I'm back in the country. It's good to stretch my legs after being pent up these last years in the city. You walk slowly, you hear? And be sure to be back here for dinner on time. You know I don't like to be kept waiting. Yes, dear, I know. Married 24 years to a good woman. No doubt about Lucy being that. She reminds me of it often enough. A placid, uneventful life. Successful business. One child, the delight of my life. The rest of it, floating along in a rut like an autumn leaf on the muddy waters in a wheel track. Fifty-ish, fattish, and feeblish after my first brush with death. Yes, I found I didn't have to be told to walk slowly. I had to. On my way to see my old friend, the Reverend Ephraim Bean. I'm coming! Come in! And behold, I come quickly. Revelations chapter 22, verse 11, I believe. <laughs> the right Reverend Ephraim Bean had your service. <laughs> Don't tell me I've changed that much. Bless my soul, my sight is getting to be a caution. Now, where are my spectacles? Uh, try your forehead. Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. David Campbell by Toffet. Is it not? It is indeed. Well, come in, come in, come in, man. Oh, hey, I see. You look in the pink, sit you down, and I'll refresh you with a glass of cider. And and you must tell me all. Uh, not much to tell. A long bout with influenza. Uh, it is a plague on the whole country this year. Uh, here now. You'll uh, have a glass. It looks just the ticket. <laughs> Tell me about your illness. The influenza epidemic this year, the good Lord knows, has been widespread and virulent. Virulent enough in my case. I'd like to have carried me off. But for some some last moment's strength I gathered somewhere and so got my reprieve. Oh, tell me, when when was its onset? The day after New Year's. Good heavens. Mm -hmm. And it's lasted all the way now into August? Well, 
The germ itself was brought under control months ago and finally washed from my system. But a curious aftermath, a, a kind of disease, or if you want, unease of the mind afflicted me. The medical term of choice, I suppose, would be a nervous breakdown. Well, my good friend, I'm glad you returned. We must shake these shadows from the corner of your soul. Uh, if they still persist. Well, I put as good a face on it as I can, but... Yes, Ephraim, they do persist. But something even more than that. Something, some inner voice called me back. Here. Eh? For what? I don't know. Sh shall I tell you what haunts and tortures me? And why I was so glad that Lisbeth was not to come? Because I don't know whether it is for good or evil. I only know it must be. Remember Isaiah. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. No, that, that, that's not what I said. Not in so many words. But look deep in your heart, David, and ask yourself if somewhere, somehow, the thought is not there. Walking back from the Reverend Beans on that early August afternoon, I thought long and deeply, trying to find with his suggested key some door to unlock my long depression. Neither then nor on succeeding walks, longer and longer as I grew stronger, could I find an answer to the strange call which tugged at me, but gave me no intimation which way to follow and find the answer. But where do you go on these long rambles of yours? Oh, nowhere in particular. I just like to walk, to listen to the drowse of the bees and feel the wind in my face. The wind. Oh, yes. First thing we know, you'll be back with the influenza again if you don't stop exposing yourself to the chill. I doubt it. That's past. You're still determined to go off on this jaunt today? Well, yes. Now I feel strong enough. I've always wanted to go back up to the Devil's Glen. Oh, so many happy times there with Lisbeth when she was a child. Well... You have your lunch all packed up that Martha made for you. Yes, Lucy. Now, don't dilly-dally till too late. Martha says a rheumatism is acting up, and that means a thunderstorm is on the way. It was a glorious Sunday afternoon. And after lunching at the Devil's Glen and basking a while in happy old memories, I was tempted to walk just a little farther up a trail I'd never taken before. I followed the stream a little, and then the trail bent into the woods. All of a sudden, I broke from the trees into a clearing, in the center of which stood the ruins of an old church and a weed-covered graveyard beside it. After pottering around, reading some of the weathered headstones, this cursed whim struck me. I'd not been to church that morning, and on an impulse, as if obeying some order from beyond imagining, before heading for home, I was driven to circle the church twice with the shins. Perhaps recalling some ancient dare as a boy that I'd refused to take because of legend. No danger befell me, except that I was suddenly swept by a wave of exhaustion. With a sigh, I, I sat on a little bench, stretching out my legs, and I found that my feet were resting on the edge of a flat tombstone. I could barely make out the legend. Jose Ribeiro. These bones lie here in an alien land, the life struck down by mine own hand. With heavy-lidded eyes, I tried to traced the date etched in Roman numerals, but a great crack across the stone obscured some of the characters. And besides, by that time, I, I found myself asleep. Dear Jose, I cannot. Never. You, you must. You love me. I love you. 
But we... We are of different faith. To the devil with faith and church. I will still make you mine. You never can. Never in this world. Then in the next. If I cannot have you alive, no one shall. Dios, forgive me for what I do. Oh, oh no. no. Don't. It's too late. It's not you. That God of neither faith will ever forgive. No, my... I was literally galvanized awake by a bolt of lightning which must have hit the tree. It was dark. And the thunder continued to grumble menacingly, so with what wits were left to me, I fled the dream and the storm and ran pell-mell for home. Letting myself in, I could hear my wife hectoring poor Martha in the kitchen about something. Gratefully, I stole upstairs, leaving my dripping greatcoat in the hole. I shut my bedroom door behind me, locking it with some strange reflex. I found a match not too wet to strike and fumbled with cold fingers to light the lamp. I trimmed the wick and I put the chimney back. Then I turned up the lamp and checked my pocket watch. Still time for dinner. At least Lucy could not complain of that. Now, holding the lamp, I crossed to the mirror and... God in heaven. Who was that? That dark, fierce, lean and saturnine face of a stranger whose eyes burned into mine as he looked back at me from the mirror. Who indeed? Dark? Lean? Certainly not the reflection of red-haired, melancholy, but gentle David Campbell. Who else, then? And why? And how? Can a childish superstition about rounding a church the wrong way really raise up the devil? I'll return shortly with Act Two. As fascinated as a moth might be, held by the lamp he holds in his hand, David Campbell is transfixed by the reflection in the mirror. The reflection of a man he has never seen before, who differs from him in every respect. Dark brown eyes for blue, a great beaked nose for his straight one. Dark curling hair instead of the familiar soft straight reddish hair already receding from his brow. Other things, too, he is conscious of. Clothes hang loosely on him, too short in the sleeve length, and the elastic bands on his trousers stretch to the breaking point to accommodate his extra height. But far more than the physical shock is the profound terror of finding himself someone other than himself. David? David, are you in there? David, why have you locked this door? Why indeed, Lucy. Only thank God I did. Time. Precious time to figure out... Wh what? What am I going to say? What can I say? Really, David, this is too mortifying of you. You must be in there. Why don't you answer? I, I'm, I'm not feeling myself right now. Let me in. I want to help. The only way you can help is... Oh, all right, I, I, I'll let you in if, if you do something for me first. What? Now, please, don't think I'm being unreasonable. It's terribly important. I'm pushing a key under the door. You see it? Yes. It's the key to the old roll-top desk in my study. I want you to open it on the left-hand side, the first row of pigeonholes. Pull them to you, and they'll slide out. There's a secret compartment there. Inside it is a letter. Get the letter and bring it back to me here. But I don't... Uh, please, do as I ask. There's no other way. No other way for what? When you bring it back, you'll see. Or maybe by some miracle all this won't be necessary. It took some more urging, but finally Lucy left on her errand. 
For myself, I returned, hoping against hope, to the mirror. No question. To outward view and sound, I was a different man. But that different man was only a prison which still held David Campbell. The inner man was still the same. But how to convince anyone else of that? David. David, I'm back. Yes, Lucy, did you find it? There's no stamp. Instead, two Cupid hearts drawn by pen with an arrow piercing them together, right? Yes, when I was young and foolish, I used to do that. One heart has the letters LCM in it, the other DMC. Of course, but David, this is absurd. We both know... But nobody else knows about this letter. I hope not. It begins... David, I know you want to, but I'm tired of waiting for you to ask me. If we are to be in love, why shouldn't we be married? If you won't ask me, I'll ask you. David, hush. Martha might hear. Really? These family secrets shouldn't be spoken out loud. They have to be. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to... to, to... David, I can't stand this nonsense anymore. Open this door immediately or I'll have to send for a doctor. Very well. Only... Only wait. Just a moment before you come in. Oh, do stop it. Open the door. Come in, Lucy. Oh. Well, well, turn up the lamp, David. I can, I can scarcely see. That's quite deliberate on my part. Come in. And close the door. Oh, very well. Now, would you mind telling me what all this fiddle-faddle is about? Keys, secret drawers, old letters. A matter of proof. I want to be sure you know who I am. What's... What's the matter with your voice? Have you caught cold in the rain? I might say I've caught a devil by the tail. Though perhaps the other way around. I think I'd better get the doctor. I think you'd better wait first. For what? For what I'm about to show you. When I turn up the lamp. Just remember that I am David as I turn up the lamp and let you see. David, no, no, no. Who, who? Oh, no, David, what... What can I say? I don't know. Whatever you feel would be best. Talk to me as honestly as you can. But, well, really, how can I? Why not? Because I... Because now that you face the actuality... <sighs> you're not sure, are you? You're not sure it's me. Well, how can you blame me? I mean... Hold, don't, don't leave this room. Stay where you are. Don't you dare make a move toward me or I'll scream the house down. We're not alone, you know. Your brother George and his friends are all downstairs. And Mr. Blodgett, the Look, gamekeeper, with a gun... It's all right, and... Lucy. I don't blame you for being scared and very brave at the same time. But the lies are not necessary. They're not lies. The house is full of... Besides us, there is only poor old Martha... My brother George has been dead for five years. Blodgett runs the general goods store and lives well over half a mile from us. And I am no stranger, no matter how I look. I'm your husband of 24 years. 25 come this November 23rd, no matter how I look. Oh, what are we going, what are we going to do? Now, darling, don't worry too much about me. Some way we'll find a way to straighten things out. About you. Somehow you brought this on yourself. I mean, what are we going to do, Elizabeth and I? What what on earth can we say to people? How can we live this down? I think there are more serious problems here to be considered first. I'm not capable of solving them. You need a doctor or a, or, or perhaps a minister. I'm going to make up the spare room where you can sleep tonight, whoever or whatever you are. Then I'll bring your dinner up to you. And tomorrow, first thing tomorrow, I'm going to the Reverend Bean and tell him everything. Maybe he can make heads or tails of it. I can't. Lucy spoke about you suffering some sort of change that... Oh. Oh, I... 
I bless my soul. Yes, 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 indeed. You do find me changed, oh, then. Oh, without a doubt. I'm rather sorry. I thought to bring my spectacles for once. I... Do you recognize me by any chance? Uh, not while I wear these. There, I, I think I shall remove them. And the shock will be less profound, David. Then you, you do believe I am David? I am a man of faith. But my looks, my, my voice... A shock. I admit, when seeing all too clearly. Yes, David, I... I accept you for who you are. But how can you? Because you ask me to. Tell me, how have you suffered this change? I could feel the sting of tears behind my stranger's eyes at the simple kindness of this good man's faith and his friendly trust. I told him what little I could of my walk that day of my discovering the ruined church, of my sudden weariness, my sitting by the grave of the man named Jose Ribeiro, my falling asleep, and the waking to the lightning striking the tree. And all the while I told him, the hope in my heart was sinking slowly as I watched the expression on that open face, too ingenuous to hide any emotion or thought. Jose... Ribeiro? Yes. Never heard of him or uh, any such family here. You don't believe me after all. Ah, just now, did, did I say that? You didn't have to. I believe the transformation. I believe that no matter how you look or sound, you are my dear friend, David Campbell. Now, other things are something else again. What other things? I've lived here all my life in Tamilworth, man and boy. I know this country like the back of my hand. I've no doubt no one knows it better, Ephraim. But just... Just what are you getting at? Well, the church, ruined or otherwise, the clearing in the forest, the graveyard. A man named Jose Ribeiro. I tell you this solemnly, since I know every tree and trace of all that area... David, my old friend, there simply is no such place. Nor would any protestation of mine sway him from that stand. And I must admit, he had shaken me. There was no recourse. I must return there and see for myself. Easier decided than accomplished. These days, Lucy watched me like a hawk. And, of course, I dared not show myself in front of Martha, to whom I would be an unexplained stranger in the house. But finally, a day came. David, I... What's the matter, Lucy? Nothing. I... It's just so, so difficult to call you by name when, looking at you, I cannot recognize the man I married. And yet... What? Come to the light a moment. Yes. I do believe. I think perhaps you're starting to change back. Oh, don't hope too much. I suppose it's just an illusion that I'm growing used to. No, no, no. I, I will never get used to it. Now, I, I have to go marketing. Don't leave the room. Martha is in the house. Just don't lock me in. I can't stand that. Give me the key. Promise you won't do anything foolish. That I can promise with all my heart. <laughs> As soon as I saw Silas Blodgett drive Lucy off, I stole down the stairs, past Martha, busy in the kitchen, and fled down the street. By the time I reached the Devil's Glen, it was late afternoon. A hazy day with the sun trying to burn through a low cloud cover. I hastened up the path I remembered, holding my breath. And suddenly, there I was, back in the familiar clearing. The ruined church, the graveyard, the shade tree part blackened by the lightning bolt that had hit it, the tortured, broken tombstone twisted with the huge crack beside the seat I had sat in. Only one thing was different as I approached. On the seat, still as death, leaning on a stick as though waiting, was the figure of a woman whose pose suggested incredible age, 
but at one and the same moment, a timeless beauty. Her head was shrouded in a veil, so this was only an impression as I approached her. Uh, am I intruding? Of course not. I hope you will forgive me, but I've been ill and I... I, I would like to sit down. May I join you? Need you ask? <laughs> sit, my darling, by me. It is so long that I've waited for you, but I knew that somehow... At the last, you would come back. Fantasy or reality? An actual meeting in an actual place? Or some strange fixation of the mind? And if so, on whose part? David? Or the woman who turns, casting the veil aside, a face that is at once as lovely as it is ancient. A woman who, with eyes half shut, might appear to the beholder, as she does to David, the loveliest and most desirable thing in the world. I'll return shortly with Act Three. The sun suddenly drops behind the horizon, and in the half-light of twilight, the age is washed away from the woman's face. Her gray eyes, fastened on David, are wide and shining with love. But to him, lovely as it is, it is a stranger's face. Search his memory as he will, he cannot remember ever having seen it before, although the voice stirs some vagrant chord of memory. You know me? How can you ask such a question, Jose? No, uh, my name is not Jose. Not yet, perhaps, but it will be. You, you think I look like someone you once knew? I know you do. But looks are unimportant. I know you are. You called me Jose, the man you think I am. Do you mean Jose Ribeiro? I mean Jose Ribeiro. The man who's buried in this grave? Who says he took his life with his own hand? Who took his life with his own hand, but who is no longer in that grave. Where is he then? Sitting beside me on this bench. Me? The living image. But only an image. Not the man, the being himself. Not yet. It takes time. No, you don't understand. I'm not the way I look. I'm someone else. My name is David Campbell. I don't look this way at all. If you don't want to look yourself, that can happen too. In time. Oh, it all takes time. But the moon is not yet at the full and I cannot stay any longer. No, wait, wait. There are so many questions I need to ask you. You mean David Campbell is the one who wants to ask the question? Of course, that's who I am. This other, this Jose Rivera, I, I can't read the date on his tombstone, but he must have died a long time ago. Long. And not so long. Two hundred years to be exact. And he looked like me... Uh, me as I am now? You could be one and the same. How can you be so sure? Because we loved. Because I should have been his wife. Uh, what? But, but th that means that you... You have to be. I must go now. It's almost dark. I can tell you more, if you wish. As much as you can comprehend. Come to tea, Thursday, but not before twilight. Past the church, take the path to the left, down to the waterfall. It's the second house, white clapboard. You can't miss it. It's almost underneath the waterfall itself. Oh, wait a minute. I, I don't even know your name. I'll teach you to remember all. 
remember Prudence Penny Packer. suddenly conscious that the night was pitch black. Flecks of light floated behind my eyes as they might when closing the lids after watching a shooting star. A sudden idea crossed my mind, but in the dark, it wasn't feasible. Besides, I would be in enough bad odor with Lucy being late to dinner as it was. It could wait till Thursday. I was convinced I knew the answer anyway to that one question. The others I could hardly wait to pose. I thought I had enough problems on my hands. I didn't reckon on the others that were about to rise. I just can't stand it any longer, David. If you are, David, going on with this charade, so I've made all the arrangements... Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. What charade? What do you mean? I can't make up any more lies or half-truths or excuses about you. Martha can't understand why, if you're ill, she can't bring a tray up to you. Cy Blodgett and the others in the village can't imagine if you don't need a doctor why you stay cooped up. Oh, I could go on and on, but I don't intend to. I've spent the day packing us up. We're going back to Boston to take you to Dr. Chambers or whoever he recommends and get you the treatment you need. I'm not leaving here before the end of the week. You go to Boston and get a good look at the world you think is turned right side up. Then come back. I have a feeling that within the week I'll know where the future lies. Or if there is any at all for me. Oh, really, Reverend Bean? You, you didn't have to have me over for meals all the time like this. Uh, the idea was for your housekeeper to drop them off at my place. Well, she did. A couple of times. But it's easier this way and provides me companionship. Besides, I had to see you today in order to write a shocking piece of information I gave you. Oh, about what? Your ruined church and graveyard. Oh? Uh, I, I've been searching through our church records. Unfortunately, very scanty and full of gaps. But I find I was wrong. There was indeed a church, and I have no doubt a graveyard... On or about just such a site as you mentioned. How I could ever have missed its ruins myself, I... Well, probably so overgrown you could never find them. Well, then how could you? Because I was... intended to find them. Why you? If for no better reason than I walked about the church with the shins... With the shins? With yes. The shins. Ah, yes. Ancient Gaelic, Tom. Uh -huh. Who with a devil his first compact begins, he first must traverse uh, the church with the shins. Eh? Anonymous. Sir. Do you uh, believe in the devil, David? Do we believe in God? If there is one. There has to be the other. I believe I've made an unwitting pact with the second. Now, 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 even granting that, you can still be saved. If you were indeed a kind of uh, reincarnation of saint Ribeiro, if I remember his name correctly... You do, you do. Then more and more you are thrown off his influence and returning to yourself. Oh, 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 David, I declare, the sun makes your hair seem full red again. And you're getting back your own nice, comfortable, roundy look. So there's still hope for me? Always has been. You say there was such a church, though, as I have described. Oh, dear me, yes. Built and established in 1695 by one Hiram Pennypacker. <laughs> Pennypacker? That's <laughs> a curious old name. Very common about these parts once. Still, for that matter... Well, now, you'll join me for dinner. No, Ephraim, good old friend. I think I will make out for myself this evening. Will I see you later? I'm not sure. I may decide to take a long, long sleep tonight. Uh, Lucy's due back in the morning. Ah, then I'll be trotting along. I have a feeling of something undone. 
Uh, have I forgotten anything? You've forgotten nothing. Not even me, who little deserve to be remembered. Goodbye, old friend. This was the Thursday. And for my own reasons, I must be early. As soon as Ephraim was gone, I headed for the Devil's Glen and beyond. I went first straight to the graveyard in the glare of the sinking afternoon sun. It took me some time to find it. A simple headstone with a simple legend. Prudence Pennypacker, 1765, 1789. But she is in her grave and oh, the difference to me. That quotation from Wordsworth shocked me beyond belief. For the subject of his lament over a lost love was for a girl named not Prudence. But do you see? From the grave, with a sense of urgency, I found my way down the path to the house beneath the waterfall and to the girl who had been buried 200 years ago and to the end of it all, I hoped, at last. You are late. Things have come up. There won't be time for tea. Not too late for some explanations. Uh, that depends on what you consider an explanation. Who was or is Prudence Pennypacker and Jose Ribeiro? What were they to each other? And where do we fit in? Well, that's asking quite a lot. No, not in my mind. As far as I can discover, both you and Jose have been buried for 200 years. I'm still alive, even if I'm locked like a hermit crab in another man's shell. Where do I go from here? Or you? Or us? Or all of us? I can answer some questions. Jose was a very romantic Portuguese who fled a dictator king who was slaughtering the nobility. With his knowledge of languages and education, he became my father's secretary. Your father was the minister of the ruined church up the hill? Yes. Jose fell in love with me and we wanted to be married, but we were of different faiths. Oh, my, the dream. What? The dream I first dreamt. Sitting on the bench by your lover's grave. Before the tree, and for all I know, I was struck by lightning. Did, did he really... Murder you and kill himself? If I could not have him, I wanted to die for him, just as he wanted to die for me. Because of my father and my faith, I was buried in consecrated ground. But because he took his own life and was an apostate, Jose was buried in unhallowed ground. He was forced to wander forever until he could find some other body not owned by the devil. I chose to share his exile, waiting for the moment when he could. And when I risked an old superstition and went about the church the wrong way, he entered into my life, my body? He took your body, not your soul. That is still yours to command. <sighs> But is it so much to hold on to? Would you not rather come with me at last and forever to love and be loved no matter who you are or what your name is? I want to. And yet I don't. I'm afraid. Maybe I can still find my way back to what I was. Well, go ahead. Try. Perhaps you can, if that's really what you want. But just remember, you can have it for only a brief moment. With me, it could be all eternity. David! Oh, God, I've been so worried. Where have you been? To the edge of beyond. What does that mean? It doesn't matter. Uh, what brought you home so soon? Elizabeth, she was so worried about you. <sighs> and I'm so glad now I came. Are you? Well, yes. Well, 
you look wonderful. You're old self again, aren't you? Oh? Y yes, Lucy. We must start building you up with right food and rest, right? Yes, Lucy. It's a positive miracle. Well, you look exactly like yourself again. It's all over, isn't it, whatever it was? You're David Campbell again. Yes, Lucy. Just the way you always were. Yes, Lucy. Oh, I could look in the mirror. And there I was. Day by day, my looks had returned to exactly what I had been to begin with. What I had neither the heart to tell Lucy, or, or perhaps even face myself, was that as my physical form remade itself outside, so inside, my soul, my character, my personality, name it what you want, was bewitched out of itself. The passion, the anger and violent emotion that ran within me was almost more than I could restrain. And I knew it would never be satisfied till I had and owned prudence. I would destroy everything for that. You see, Lisbeth, even myself, I was possessed, damned forever. When David Campbell suddenly disappeared, it was the Reverend Ephraim Bean who led the search. A deep instinct told the old man David had returned to the graveyard and the ruined church, but was never found. What was found was David's body, floating in a pool underneath a small waterfall not far above the Devil's Glen. The body lies buried now in one of Boston's most exclusive cemeteries, the body, where the soul has gone, is another question entirely. I'll be back shortly. So let us end this tale, as the Reverend Ephraim Bean might, with a quotation from Shakespeare out of a play named The Tempest. Our revels now are ended. We are such stuff as dreams are made on. And our little life is rounded with a sleep. Our cast included Alexander Scorby, Laurie March, Ian Martin, and Marion Seldes. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs> <laughs>